Ho, 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 ho. It's a victory holiday week podcast on one giant step. I'm Sean Morash. He's Paul Dettino. Thank you all for listening and subscribing and downloading us. Of course, free on the Odyssey app and anywhere podcasts are downloadable, as well as checking us out on YouTube. Plenty to dissect from a Giants gotta have it, had to have it. They ended up having it. 20 to 12 win down at FedEx Field versus the Washington Commanders. We will get into everything from Kayvon Thibodeau bursting onto the scene and letting the nation know he's elite from Daniel Jones having maybe the best drive of the year for the Giants. And of course, some whining about the officiating down in Washington. Paul, hello. How are you? Good morning, Sean. Glad to say that I'm safe and sound, unlike a lot of those folks who had to dodge ice balls up in Buffalo the other night. Oh, how crazy was that? And and Paul, you know, that's a perfect segue to what we get to with the Giants. First of all, just league-wide, what a weekend of football. I mean, the the epic comeback by the by the Vikings versus the Colts as the Colts did everything. I mean, the Vikings did everything they could to lose the game in the first half. They come back. By the way, we got to hope maybe the Vikings got it all out of their system in that second half, and they're a little low uh, <laughs> next week on Saturday. Uh, to obviously what happened on Saturday night, the Buffalo and Dolphin game back-to-back, the fans singing, let it snow, the snowballs falling. Then how about them Cowboys, Paul, blowing that lead and losing it over? That's a shame. Uh, it's always a shame when you see the Cowboys lose a game like that in late December. Uh, the Jets doing us no freaking favors as the Lions. And by the way, that supposed elite Jet defense gives up a 51-yarder to Brock Wright scamper and score there. And then, of course, Tom Brady first time in his career blowing a 17 nothing lead. Like, the league was wild. The Raider Patriot ending the league. The, the Joe Judge Patrick Gramble that was flexed out for the Giants. The league was wild yesterday. And it culminated in Giants commanders on Sunday night football. And, Paul, I know you were at the stadium. Boy, TV, they couldn't get enough of, you know, the NFC East, this back stuff. They made the Giants and Commanders last night feel like it was the Super Bowl. I had jitters. Martin Sheen voiced an opener. It was uh, it was great theater. But, you know, the Giants end up winning a football game on the grand NFL stage of Sunday night football to cap off again the wildest weekend. So before we get into the ins and outs, just immediate reaction on just feeling good to win a football game again. Well, you, you talk about a team that had lost 11 consecutive primetime games that had been 1-8-1 and one in its last 10 games against the NFC East, okay, had had the very unsatisfying tie, which should have been a lot more controversial than it was two weeks ago at MetLife Stadium. And you wrap all of that up, and then you put them into hostile territory in prime time with a crowd that was going absolutely nuts. But, Sean, you would have liked it because you would have fit in. Because on the Giants' half of the stadium, especially in the lower level and behind the end zones, there were quite, and I mean quite, a few blue garments and jerseys and and jackets and scarves. And those folks, those, those smaller percentage Giants fan folks that were at FedEx Field were probably almost as loud as the crazed Commanders fans that were enveloping the rest of the stadium. It made for such a loud venue that, as you can probably hear, I've lost part of my voice, and I was just trying to talk to people next to me on the sideline. Paul, it sounded like such a fun environment, and you're right, and maybe these guys were all next to the boom parabolic mics, but... Or not just late in the game, audible. Let's go Giants chance were heard throughout that crowd. Chance of defense too. Contest. And deep, yep. And I was gonna say the defense chance. You know, I turned to my dad, and my sister watching the game going, This is incredible how the mics are picking this up. So, you know, before we get into the whole way the game finished, let's talk about the way the game started. The Giants, of course, go down three nothing in this game. And I thought the defense was, of course, in a good spot. Bend, but don't break. Uh, They were able to do some things there. The offense, of course, gets killed by a couple Slayton drops slash aggressive defense. Evan Neal, you know, at times, bad penalties in this game. But the game really begins to change, Paul, with Kayvon Thibodeau, who was making every play on the early drops. I mean, he was in on everything, chasing down guys, stopping the run, going into the pass. But similar to what we saw in overtime in that game two weeks ago with Ojolari and Thibodeau, Thibodeau gets back near that goal line, strip sack, And is the same guy who actually picks it up and scores. And as we know, Paul, that is the signature moment and a moment 
maybe not on the level of you know visually pleasing with El Odell Beckham Jr. catching that ball on Sunday Night Football one hand, but that is a moment that I think no Giant fan will ever forget when thinking about primetime special moments, the Kayvon Thibodeau strip sack and score. That's a moment Giant fans have been longing for. Yeah, you know, I, I love that you brought that up so early in the program because it was a very significant play for even a bigger reason than what you just stated. Yes, it did turn the tempo over the game and let everybody know that the Giants were going to be in this tug of war. But in reality, two weeks ago in overtime at MetLife Stadium, Thibodeau clubs Heineke for a sack un uncontested to the quarterback inside the one-yard line. And when he went for the sack, he simply went to hit the quarterback hard. The ball never came free. Heineke held on, and Washington was able to escape. Well, this time, a more educated Kayvon Thibodeau, because now he learned from his mistake of not going for the takeaway, he went for the strip. And he clearly, clearly had one mission when he got back into the pocket. He was chopping for that football. Yep. And that shows me an intelligent player who understood what he was told and made the correction. And, and I just thought that that was a very – I'm sure the coaches will harp on that this yeah. morning and tell him about how that's how you're supposed to do it. And I'm sure they're very proud of him. I actually texted O.C. Yumanura right after the game. O.C. was at the World Cup. And I texted <laughs> O.C. and I said, I could not help but think about you when he went for that strip sack. And it was perfect. And O.C. texted me back. He was at the World Cup but he was watching the Giants game and he did see it and it was perfect. And, and he agreed. That's the maturing of a player. When you learn from a mistake and don't make it a second time, big time play by Thibodeau. Big time play. And we're going to get to another big time play he made that quite frankly could have saved the season a little bit later on when we get to that final sequence. But from that, Paul, I think the real next key to the game in a positive manner happens when the Giants get off the field on that following ensuing commander's drive after Thibodeau scores. And then the Giants put together certainly the best drive since that London drive that Daniel Jones orchestrated without Saquon Barkley late in that game in London. But to go essentially the length of the field and complete with so many, you know, BB throws to Richie James, including Dable deciding I'm not going to kick in cold weather this long field goal. We're going to go for it on fourth and nine. And that play. Daniel Jones was in full command. And look, they're going to be still be the Jones naysayers when all is said and done say, well, look, the offense still only put up 13 points in this game. Jones in this game was really killed by those Neil penalties and was certainly killed by drops along the way. Daniel Bellinger had another drop later on. But that drive to me was a guts drive, 7-3. Your offense hadn't done much all game. You can completely give the defense, by the way, a blow on the bench. They had been on the field for so much to yep. go down the field and orchestrate that and, and quick passes, not allowing yourself to get sacked like what happened in the first game. Paul, that to me was the signature moment of the game was just taking all that time off the clock and finishing it with seven and not three. As much as we just talked about Thibodeau's play, and that would be his defining play so far of this season, I have to agree with you beyond the Green Bay drive, Without Barkley, this drive, this drive to me is everything you need to know about Daniel Jones. He was flawless. He had to overcome the the Neil penalty you mentioned. Um, I, I don't know what else I can add to what you said because the fourth down throw to Richie James on the crossing route was right on the button. In fact, oh. every throw he made on this drive was on the button. And when you're going to go, 18 plays and 97 yards. And oh, by the way, again, did have to overcome one full start penalty. You don't have any room for the slightest of error on that drive because it will short circuit. And, and, and that kind of drive is basically meant for you to somehow short circuit and shoot yourself in the foot. And Daniel Jones was in complete command and did everything exactly right on that drive. And that made it 14 to three Giants. And as uh, as we all know, Sean, um, you know, going into halftime with that kind of lead certainly set the tempo for what was going to be a very uh, interesting second half. 
Yeah, and then when the second half starts, I'm not going to lie, I I was greedy. I was saying, now go down the field here, and they got close to midfield. That was a point in time where then Washington answers right back, and of course they get the penalty on the two-point try, and then they miss the extra point, and it becomes a 20-9 to game. Uh, you know, if the Giants um, – not a 20-9 to game at the point. I guess it was a 14-9 to game. 14-9. to I, I would have loved to, of course, gone up 21 or 17-3 at that point. But, okay, that wasn't the case. So the Giants are able to figure this out and, you know, hem and all. So I'm going to fast forward here. And I know other big moments happened throughout the game, and Thibodeau continued to control. The Giants were getting gashed by the run. Brian Robinson was doing an excellent job, you know, just getting yards after contact. But the Giants were doing enough – and it kind of felt like, all right, we're going to hold on here. We're going to get a field goal heel here, field goal there. Now, two things happen. When the Giants get the ball back, Saquon Barkley, I have to give him his credit as well. For a guy who might have been banged up, beat up the last few weeks, blaming on the offensive line. Who knows? Some of us had fans. Saquon Barkley had a signature drive for him where the Giants end up getting those three points to get to 20 uh, and make it an eight-point lead where he has basically they're running the same play over and over again. He's making guys miss. And Saquon, one thing he had struggled with all year was breaking tackles. He, he did that that entire drive, all those spinny moves. Saquon did an excellent job, Paul, on I guess what it amounted to be the Giants' final drive to set them up and go up eight. Well, I'm going to go back just a moment and talk about the third quarter drive because after it's 14-9, Barkley has a nine-yard run up the gut, a six-yard uh, right screen pass, a seven-yard run off right tackle as the Giants come right back after the commander's score and they get a 50-yard field goal by Gano yeah. to make it 17-9 with about three minutes left in the third quarter. I thought the Giants, with that immediate answer, True. even though it was only three points, was incredibly important to stop the bleeding. Because at this point in time, the place is rocking, and the commanders are looking for some momentum. And the Giants go right down the field and at least get that field goal. Barkley was instrumental in that drive. It's true. You're talking about, obviously, the drive in the fourth quarter where he starts off at the Giants' own 14, six minutes to go. Uh, this is after the Giants with a phenomenal goal line stand. The uh, forced fumble by Dexter right. Lawrence. Which, by the, the way, recovery. good point. Brian Dable deserves so much credit for pulling the trigger on that challenge. I sat there, not that I, I'm not in the yep. stadium, I'm not in the couch. My sister was the only one shouting, I think that was out, I think that was out before I saw the challenge flag come out. Um, it, it was an unbelievably time and look quality control coaches. Whoever's telling telling Dable to do that, you know, we hadn't had a moment like that all season with the challenge flag, at least that I can remember, Paul, where it was absolutely a game changer that he was able to pull the trigger and throw that flag and won the challenge. Yeah, he get he gets a word from upstairs. There's a couple of assistants who particularly are are focused on that kind of thing. They told him the challenge. Lawrence forces the fumble uh, inside the Giants' ten, recovered by. Leonard Williams, and that sets the Giants up with a 17 to 12 lead and six minutes to go. And my notes, I, I mean, look at this Barkley for 12, Barkley for 15, Barkley for 14, Barkley for three, yeah. one, three. Paul, they were breaking it's, the will of that Washington defensive front, and the offensive and line deserves credit. They were mauling them in the run game at that point. Without question, without question. And this happens. Again, understand the environment, Sean. The momentum from the commanders knocking on the doorstep, their fans are going crazy thinking they're going in for the go-ahead touchdown. So the place is, is almost almost like an earthquake hit it. I mean, it, it's, it's the decibels are off the charts. And the Giants crawl out from the shadow of their own goalpost and Barkley by force of will. Do you know? Even the great Barry Sanders posted video of Barkley yeah, on that, that drive on Twitter. I saw that, yeah. And Barkley was That's how much little. respect Barkley gained on that drive. And, and he looked like the powerful Saquon Barkley. Well, Not the fancy Saquon Barkley, but the powerful and determined Saquon Barkley that wanted to take this team on his back. And, of course, the Giants wind up with the 50-yard you know, field goal, oh. his second of the night. And that makes it an eight-point game, which at least there, well, let's sure. just say the thought did cross my mind that could we actually 20, see 20. another 20 to 20 tie? Paul, you <laughs> sound like my dad yesterday. I told him to shut up. Just shut your mouth when he was bringing that up. Paul, on that note on Barkley, before we get to what happened here in the final sequence, I thought 
there are a couple things, and this is going to come from a giant fan perspective. And I brought up Kayvon Thibodeau having that. You know, this season has been so full of memories, right? And for whatever reason, I keep coming back to the Titan game, the Packer game, those two specially. But we had a moment here, okay? And as a fan, you know, when you think about giant running backs, you know, willing their way, having those moments, Tiki Barber had quite a few of them. I remember that Saturday game versus Kansas City. But how about 2006 running the Giants into the playoffs in Washington? Clearly, that was a huge moment in that spot in prime time, a Saturday night game. I go back to that Sunday night game with Derek Ward versus Carolina in 2008 to clinch yeah. home field advantage. You know, I know it wasn't over 100 yards. I He had the touchdowns, 83 yards. But of all the moments that Saquon has had in his career, and I know he's had some bigger 65-yard, 70-yard runs for touchdowns, I thought for me, for all the criticism he's gotten, and I've given him plenty, this was a spot where the Giants had to have it, the game dictated it, and Barkley had to, in many ways, put the team on his back and churn up some time and basically put a nail in the coffin. Now, of course, Washington's going to get the ball back here, but Barkley willed themselves to make that an eight-point lead, and to me, Whatever happens in this offseason going forward, and hopefully we have a couple more good memories here, Saquon Barkley. To me, last night is the night that whenever I think about Saquon Barkley and I want to smile, that's it. Sunday night in Washington with the season on the line, Saquon Barkley came through late. Seven carries for 13 yards for Barkley in the first half. 11 carries for 74 yards, I believe I just calculated in the second half. Okay? this game was going to come down to crunch time. You and I both knew that there was not going to be a comfortable margin by the time the final right. gun went off, Sean. We right. all knew it. I think and I picked an eight-point win. I, it was a little higher scoring, but I thought I picked an eight-point win too, yeah. Yeah, I had had 24-20, as you, right. as you okay. recall. And, you know, for Barkley to be basically, I won't say shut down, but certainly controlled in the first half. It's not like he got a lot of touches. Only seven carries. Oh, they were passing. Yards. They were passing early on first down. They were changing up the right. game plan, which I thought was smart. Right. And he did run for a touchdown, by the way. Right, uh, the also, Wildcat run. The first right. half. All right, so it was fine. But, but now they needed him. They needed him not only to grind clock, they needed him to shut down the momentum of the commanders. And then, in fact, deliver enough of a punch that it wasn't just a counter, but it was a damaging blow. And that's what made Saquon Barkley literally a triple value threat late in this ball game from the midpoint of the third quarter all the way down to the end of the game. It was it was a very, very impressive display, despite only finishing, I think, with 83 yards on the on the night. All right, Paul, let's get to what amounts to be the most controversial drive, the drive that may put the Giants into the playoffs defensively, the Washington Commanders uh, going down the field. And obviously they hit the big play to Dotson, and I get him a little tired. It was a Pinnock, Pinnock who had the yeah. – uh, okay, now this – I really thought – He was there. He was there. He was I mean, there. It's, it's an incredible catch. Okay. So the commanders get down here. They get inside the red zone. And right off, before we get to the final, final sequence, a play that might feel insignificant at the time because there are many of us who might have the theory, hey, just let him score, and then let's get the ball back in regulation here. Thibodeau. Kayvon Thibodeau, who was the story of the entire <laughs> game, <laughs> to come up and stop Taylor Heineke one yard short. And again, at first glance, I'll, I'm not going to lie, there was even a part of me that said – Man, I kind of want as much time as possible for this offense to go back. To stop him at the one ends up, on top of his touchdown, strict sack fumble earlier, being an enormous difference in the game. Thibodeau, man, again, all over the field. What a freaking play, Paul. 12 uh, total tackles, nine solos, and three assists for Thibodeau. Of course, the, the trifecta uh, earlier with the strip sack, the recovery, and the touchdown. What what more could you ask for from this young man? Uh, he has become an impact player. Uh, here we are in the final third of the season, and he's healthy, recovered from that knee injury, yep. got rid of the brace. Every single week we are seeing more and more and more of impact plays from him. And I also explained earlier about the astuteness of going for that strip sack in that situation. This guy is maturing and growing right before our eyes and being being 
a top 10 pick like he was supposed to be yeah. all along. And, yeah. and that's the beauty of it. Sean, we talked before the season, and one of the things that I said to people was, if the Giants are, I, I thought they were an eight-win team this year. I told everybody, eight and nine, but they're going to need everything to go right to maybe squeeze out 10 wins. But when I say that, it means that this rookie class is going to have to really, really come together early and have a significant impact throughout the season. Well, here, Thibodeau is having that impact, the kind of impact that can get you over that hump and into the playoffs. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And look, the NFL has been blessed with a lot of really good rookies this year, okay? I mean, Chris Olave with the Saints has been a stud at receiver. Obviously, we know what Aiden Hutchinson has done with the Lions. Sauce Gardner with the Jets. There was no rookie this year that had a singular bigger impact on a bigger game than Kayvon Thibodeau did in Washington on Sunday night. Uh, to me, that's just facts. I mean, that 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 I mean, that is how impressive and important what he did was. You know what, Sean? Aiden Hutchinson of the Lions just totally dismantled the Giants about a month or so ago Definitely. at MetLife Stadium. Definitely. I'd say that game would be right up there too. Yeah, no, and look, it's, I'm not dismissing the other rookies, but, you know, when you consider primetime, two teams even, play, winners likely going to the playoffs, and right. he was a one-man wrecking crew. He was a one-man wrecking crew. Now, with that, Paul, sets up, of course. Brian Robinson goes to run in the end zone. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, and this is – now, this is where I'm going to get a jumble. Do you have it? Is this before or after the McLeod dropped interception, which – Stroke the McLeod nuts. dropped interceptions on first and goal from the 10 yard line. Okay. So then Heineke runs to the one. And in fact, right at my feet, Thibodeau knocks him, knocks okay. him down. So the, Thibodeau, the, the, Thibodeau, so the Thibodeau tackle happens right after the McLeod dropped interception, which yeah. was one of those. Oh yeah. no, no. Yeah. You know, they yeah. had that. So, okay. So now Robinson at the one seemingly gets in the end zone and here's the flag and the flag comes for, Wait for it because giant fans are used to this illegal formation. Now, the controversy here, Paul, which I think is pretty settled if people have paid attention, is that Terry McLaurin looks up at the ref and gives the one hand up to see if he's set or the line judge. The line judge seemingly gives him the okay. However, what is completely lost in this play, if you watch the replay, is immediately after he's told he's okay, there is still shuffling going on as far as motioning and stuff going on with Washington. And yes. that motion both by a tight end not being set on the left side and the slot receiver coming back in motion is what now negates the proper line of scrimmage setting. So while McClurm is giving the okay, people have paid attention to that and not the formation stuff that happened in the immediacy right before the snap. And it's the sliver. And look, these have been pain in the ass penalties. The Giants have gotten nabbed with them all year long. We've screamed right. about them all year long. In the end, Paul, I hate to say it, I've seen it now. If it's, if it's been called on us all year, right call. Yeah, and, and that's the problem, Sean, you know, because all year long, these officials have gone flag happy on the illegal formation penalty. It's become, yeah. to me, almost like that annoying calf injury that guys keep coming up with almost every other week. Right. I mean, right. And, 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 and look, I do understand why any fan would get ticked off. We Again, we've seen it in like every NFL game. Yeah. But here's the it's problem. It's annoying for sure, yeah. The officials told everybody before the season. They told all the teams, we're going to be very, very careful about this. We're going to look at it carefully because offenses are becoming more complex. They're trying more trickery. They're trying more personnel groupings and more different combinations. And so these officials have been looking at that penalty under a microscope. So here's the problem. It's been going on all season. You can't complain about it now if you're a Washington fan and say, oh, my goodness, in the spirit of the rule, this is really stupid because how did it really impact the play? Well, that's not the way it goes. Right. Because the rule is black and white, and it's very specific. And, and if there is an infraction, it's either called or not called. And, and they've been calling it. Yeah. Look, the Giants so are what, several... what do you want to do? Well, the Giants have had several drives this year derailed by that exact penalty. Yes! And oh, by yes! the way, I know this is really butterfly effecty, but if they weren't calling it all year, you don't know. One of those drives could have amounted to a touchdown in one of these one-possession games where the Giants win another game, and then maybe this isn't as Correct. important to the Commanders. So don't now, give me to that be nonsense. Fair, Sean, to be fair, 
Okay. I was right on the goal line at the time when this happened, or like on the, on the three or four yard line. I wasn't maybe right there, but I was right there, if you know what I mean. Right. And the official, the official, when the play was run, he wasted no time, never put up his hands for a touchdown because he knew he had made the call. And he was already charging towards the commanders and telling his brethren, it's not a touchdown. Right. He never hesitated. He knew what his call was. He was making the call. And it didn't matter if Robinson went over the goal line or not. It was clear from my perspective, and he was right there in front of me. He had already decided that there was a call. Now, honestly, at the time that it happened in live action, to my eyes, I had actually thought there might have been an illegal motion. Okay. And you're talking about the, right. the shift? The shift. I thought doing. that might have been the thing that he saw. Right. I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I thought maybe somebody right. – Move it was yeah set. right. It wasn't an illegal motion, but the motion did have an impact on why you know yeah. the lineup. Right, exactly. But 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 initially, I'm thinking, oh, he called him for a legal motion. Right. This thing's coming back. Uh so that did not, to me, that did not warrant controversy. Which brings us, of course, to the final play of the game, and Heineke drops back, throws back, and we're gonna get to what happened. How Heineke's allowed to make that throw. And the throw is incomplete as Darnay Holmes, in a very physical battle, knocks down the ball. Now, let's take out what me and you, Paul, know is about to come. On a normal third down conversion, could I see? have I seen that cold pass interference in the NFL? I have. I will be fair. I absolutely have. However, I've also seen plenty more obvious ones not called in the NFL. And also, I've seen a lot of fans in the NFL say, hey, let the players play on these big crucial downs on fourth downs and stuff. Stop getting so flag happy. But it's funny when a flag doesn't come out, all of a sudden everybody wants a flag. That being said, Paul, you hit the money on the head here. Money on the head, whatever. You hit something on the head. I'm very tired on Twitter, and it's so accurate. Cave on Thibodeau, which was almost, I got to be honest with you, from a Giant fan perspective, Cave on Thibodeau, what happens on this play almost makes the play anticlimactic. And a lot of it has to do with what happened to Daniel Bellinger in Jacksonville. So now I'm just trying to put everybody in a giant fan head here. This in real time. Kayvon Thibodeau comes off the edge and gets hit into the face and stops. And Kayvon Thibodeau, who's a motor who hasn't stopped all night, is grabbing his eyes. And you're watching this on TV going, Heineke scrambled around. Thibodeau is completely stopped here. He's gotten hit in the eyes. And that no presence of an edge rusher allows Heineke to completely step up and throw this ball, which ends up going incomplete. And everybody, RG3, whoever can find on Twitter, Commanders fans everywhere, how do you not call pass interference? How do you not call pass interference? Well, how do you not call legal hands to the face on Kayvon Thibodeau? Because if that's actually called, you don't even get the playoff. They allowed two things not to happen on that play. Thibodeau's basically, his eyes look like it's going to be gouged out. The only reason a play gets off is because Thibodeau gets poked completely in the eye. That's a penalty. The, yes, everybody's right. There was an egregious missed call on the final play of the game. But it's the illegal hands to the face ball. You know what's really funny about that particular play, Sean? Go back and listen to Bob Papa's call on the radio, or for that matter, Mike Tirico's call on TV. Both play-by-play -play announcers immediately said Thibodeau is out of the play. Yeah. Papa actually called the poke in the eye. Tarico simply said, oh, Thibodeau's just taken out of the play. Yeah. Both play-by-play -play guys saw what had happened, saw Thibodeau's reaction, and saw that he was no longer rushing the passer. He was in great pain, and he was actually walking himself away from the play. Yeah. So if the play-by-play -play guys could see it, it's just kind of odd to me that none of the officials could have possibly seen that. And by the way, so let's, just, let's just think about that for a second. And what really makes me laugh is that I'm seeing so much of the published word and even the vocal word by some folks who happen to be on the air this morning who apparently either did not watch or did not listen to the call yeah. and have absolutely no idea that Kayvon Thibodeau was inflicted with hands to the face by left tackle Charles Leno and clearly, clearly had taken himself out of the play 
because of a penalty that was not called. What, did, did everybody who watched the game last night have the volume turned down and decide right. not to open their eyes until the ball reached the end zone? Is that what happened, Sean? It just shows you, Paul, what you're looking for in a play because I, even as that ball flutters down, I, my immediate reaction was, oh, my God, I hope Kayvon isn't badly hurt. I had visions of what happened to Bellinger. So, uh, Man, you and I sometimes really think exactly alike because yeah, like, I thought I thought Thibodeau was hurt. I thought he yeah. was significantly hurt, and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck just happened to him? Right, for him to stop. So, you know, of course I celebrated the win, but I, I took about a minute and a half to really go, oh, my goodness, okay, we won the game, because the whole time staring at Thibodeau going, this is terrible. He got hurt, he got hurt, he got hurt. So it's crazy to me. And, look, I'm just going to say it. You're seeing a lot of it on Twitter and a lot of it everywhere. If your takeaway on that final play is, can you believe they didn't call pass interference? It's lazy analysis. It's just flat-out lazy analysis. Yeah. And you're not, and you're completely missing the biggest star of the game getting jammed in the face, and that's the whole reason the pass could go off. It is lazy analysis. Do yourself a favor, Sean. If you really want to have more fun with this play, go back and look at it. And Thibodeau gets poked in the eye, and Schweitzer, the center, has his hands right up here in the front of Leonard Williams' shoulder pads, right up on the top, and he is yanking. Yeah. With both arms as hard as he possibly can to prevent Leonard Williams from closing the front of the pocket. And he holds on for, let's just say, more than a few spoonfuls of soup. Yeah. And that's it. So I don't want to okay. hear it today. But but no, yeah. nobody, nobody saw that. I, they only saw the contact in the end zone. And Paul, I, I know we're a little we're a little bit over here, but on top of that, and if you don't even want to listen to the Thibodeau stuff for a second. Last year, the Dexter Lawrence play that completely changed everything, where the league actually admitted a mistake. Uh, right. Too bad how sad. A couple weeks ago, missing a pass interference on Darius Slayton, the terrible taunting call against Feliciano, which I think Feliciano shouldn't have done anyway. The, you know, let's not act like the commanders have been, you know, this team stricken with these penalties. The Giants have gotten screwed plenty in these games in Washington. Now, Paul. John, it's the quicksand of mediocrity in the NFL where I say it all the time. Injuries, bounces, bad breaks. And calls or non-calls have much more impact on wins and losses yeah. today than they've ever had in the NFL before. And you know what people say? It's a human game. You got to live with it. You can't cry over spilt milk. What happens, happens. Be good enough. Don't put yourself in position to where a call could cost you a game. That's all I've heard for years and years and years and years. Well, you know what? If it's been good enough for the uh, NFL brethren to say that for the last decade, well, then it's good enough to say it again this morning, isn't it? Totally is. Totally is, Paul. And uh, I don't want to wrap yet without mentioning two names, at least worthy. I think you'll agree with me on this, but I think they're honorable mentions. And when I tell you I am about out of gas here as I'm on two hours sleep, I will tell you this. All right. Two guys who were not out of gas that I think honorable mention for their play last night. Number one, Landon Collins, that final activation off the practice squad. He was so good downhill in a pivotal spot where the Giants had gotten run over a bunch. He gave the Giants some thump uh, on the inside linebacker downhill stuff in that run game. I thought that was a tremendous moment last night for Landon Collins, Paul. Yeah, and you know, I talked to him after the game, and he wasn't very emotional about it. I thought he might be. He was kind of a matter of fact about it. And That's he good. knows what he can do. He believes in himself, and he wants to be part of the reason that this team makes the playoffs. And I do think that he did make some very significant veteran-type plays yesterday where his smarts and his toughness can help show the way for some of the younger guys on this team. And the other guy was an absolute goat a week ago, and I think has had a really subpar year, but I thought it was really good. And you're not going to get this many other podcasts. I thought Jamie Gillen last night had a really good night punting the football. I mean, the Giants were pinned deep a couple times. Uh, and he, in a game that came down to a lot of field position, look, I don't have stats to back this up, but I thought that was one of his best punting games I've seen him punt this year for the New York Giants. Well, I'll give you a couple numbers. Uh, three of his five punts down inside the 20, and his net was 41.8. Uh, Jeff Fiegels would tell you he'd sign up for that any day of the week. Yeah. It and oh, like oh by the way, can I just throw Aziz Ojolari into this thing? Oh, too? he's been great. He's been great since coming back. Oh, again. The, the, the Thibodeau Ojolari edge rushing combination has really, really paid dividends for Wink Martindale because 
The Giants got gashed, what, 150 yards, I think, last night on the ground. Yeah. So let's not make any mistake. They did give up some, some big plays. They did give up a consistent amount of yardage in the ground game. But as I said to Wink Martindale as we were leaving the stadium yesterday, I said, Wink, big-time players make big-time plays in big-time moments. And that's what the Giants did last night. That's right. They weren't consistently great for 60 minutes. But the guys who needed to show up showed up when the spotlight was on at its hottest. And yeah. that sometimes is what you need to do to gut yourself to a victory. And now the Giants, on a short week, get ready for Christmas Eve in Minnesota to take on the Vikings. And there's a lot of scenarios that could happen. The Giants could be in position to clinch a playoff spot on Saturday. So we will get you all set at the end of the week and look ahead to Christmas Eve in Minnesota. Uh, Paul, where can we get you on Twitter all week with practice updates and whatnot? At Giants WFAN. And you can get me at Mraz CBS. Thanks to producer Adam. And thanks to everybody for taking one giant step with us.